Chemical bonds are the glue that hold atoms together to make compounds. There are two kinds of bonds that can hold atoms together to make a compound. One of them is the ionic bond. The other one is the covalent bond. For now, we'll take a look at how ionic bonding works. Ionic bonding works because opposite charges attract, and positive ions and negative ions will attract. It's easy for these ions to be separated from each other, which means that when melted or dissolved in water, when the ions separate, the resulting solution or liquid is able to conduct electricity. When dissolved in water, this is known as an electrolyte, a solution with mobile electrons allowing the solution to conduct electricity. In order for an ionic bond to form, you have to have an element that wants to give up its valence electrons, a metal, and an element that wants to gain those valence electrons, a nonmetal. Sodium has a low electronegativity, 0.9. Chlorines is more than three times as much, 3.2. Therefore, when the two of them come together, sodium will lose its valence electrons and chlorine will gain them as such. The sodium, having lost its valence electron, will have an ion charge of plus one. And the chloride, having gained the one valence electron, will have an ion charge of minus one. And the two oppositely charged ions attract each other. When sodium loses its valence electron, it's referred to as oxidation. When the chloride gains sodium's valence electron, that is known as reduction. The two oppositely charged ions will simply attract each other. And that is what forms the ionic bond the attraction between positive and negative charge. It's not a particularly strong bond. It's a surface attraction only, which means it's not that hard to break. Unlike with molecules, when you melt ionic substances, the ionic bond breaks. When you melt covalent substances, the covalent bond doesn't break. So ionic bonds are not particularly strong. In order to determine if the bond is going to be ionic, first you can look at the elements involved. If one element is a metal and the other element is a nonmetal, in general, it's going to be an ionic bond. The other thing you can do is look up the electronegativity difference, the difference in electronegativity between the two bonded atoms. Now, according to this information, sodium is 0.9, chlorine is 3.2, which means that the electronegativity difference, or END, is going to be 2.3. Anything higher than 1.7 means that the more electronegative atom has enough pull to remove the other atom's valence electron. In other words, all you need to do is provide a little ionization energy and that electron will go right on over. The 1.7 rule is just a rough guideline. The greater the electronegativity difference is, the greater the ionic character is. In other words, if there was a bond between sodium and fluorine, which has an electronegativity of 4.0, that would be an electronegativity difference of 3.1, which would mean that sodium fluoride would have a greater ionic character than sodium chloride does. It's a sliding scale. The lower the electronegativity difference, the less ionic character. The greater the electronegativity difference, the greater the ionic character. I wonder why Disney never created an ionic character. If you're going to bond fluorine with calcium, take note that fluorine needs to gain one more valence electron to make a stable octet, but calcium has two valence electrons to lose. Therefore, calcium will lose one of its valence electrons to that fluorine, and that fluorine will end up negative one. But calcium is not done yet. It needs to find somewhere else to dump its last remaining valence electron. And this is where a second fluorine can come in handy. Calcium will lose its last valence electron to the second fluorine. The second fluorine will be also negative one in charge, and the calcium will end up with a plus two charge. This is the correct ionic dot diagram for calcium fluoride, or CaF2. Properties of ionic compounds include the following. Even though the ionic bond is not particularly strong, 
Ionic compounds are going to have high melting and boiling points. The reason is you have to overcome that attraction of positive to negative, and you need a fair amount of heat in order to do that. Remember, when you melt a substance that's ionic, you're breaking the ionic bond. So you're going to need a little bit higher temperature to get the job done. For example, sodium chloride melts at 1,074 Kelvin, compared to 273 Kelvin for water. The difference? Water is molecular. When you melt water, you're not worried about breaking the bonds between the hydrogen and oxygen. All you're doing is separating molecules for each other. And as you'll see in the next topic, it's going to be a lot easier to do that. Ionic compounds are also brittle. Their crystal lattices are easily crushable. Ionic liquids and solutions conduct electricity because they contain freely moving ions. If the ions are free to move around, they can carry electrical charge. Why? Because ions are charged particles. And if they're moving, they're carrying charge. Ionic solids, on the other hand, the ions are locked into a crystal lattice and unable to move around. Therefore, they can't conduct electricity because their charged particles are locked in place.